So, welcome to episode three of Rocket Talks, and in this particular uh, this particular episode, we will be going over rocket engine cooling techniques. And so, what exactly do I mean by rocket engine cooling technique? You know, um, when your 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 rocket engine nozzle your rocket engine nozzles and thrust chambers when you're going through combustion, right, they get very, very, very hot, right? We have really, really hot expanding gases to produce our thrust, and those can exceed temperatures of a lot. Those can exceed temperatures of a lot, like thousands upon thousands of degrees centigrade. And so when you're talking about, you know, materials that you're actually using to make your thrust chamber out of, typically something like copper or steel that's used have much lower, or aluminum, have much lower heat capacities for your really, really hot combustion products. So you have to employ some certain, you know, engineering innovations to help keep your overall rocket engine cold to where it's not melting because if you start melting your combustion chamber or your nozzle you're going to be in for a really really bad day so we'll be covering today episode three rocket engine cooling techniques um so there are some very important uh things to consider when you're actually talking about which technique that you actually want to use for your rocket engine right um, so there's a very wide spectrum of requirements. There's things such as how much thrust your engine is uh, supposed to be able to output, um, the operation environment, whether it's going to be solely in the atmosphere versus a vacuum engine, um, your burn time and life cycle requirements. Is it supposed to be reused and is it just going to be like a first stage engine that only has to burn once for like 100 seconds versus a vacuum engine, which might have to burn for minutes at a time, right? That will change the heat load on your rocket engine nozzle in your thrust chamber. Um, you also have to think of things such as how your vehicle is designed and how your engine is designed, right? If you're supposed to have only one rocket engine nozzle versus a cluster of rocket engine nozzles, well, that's going to kind of impair you from using like radiative uh, cooling and, and other things like that, right? You actually have to worry about how your rocket engine nozzle is supposed to integrate to your vehicle. Um, and then you also have some uh, more things that you have also have to keep in mind, such as your propellant choice and your engine design, right? So. For propellant choice, that kind of limits you on what you can actually use for like regenerative cooling. So like, are you using cryogenic propellants, or are you even using like solid propellants where you can use cryogenic, uh, you know, regenerative cooling? So there's a lot of things to uh, keep into mind about that. Um, all these spacecraft engines and their cooling techniques, they all have a very certain common problem, right? The energy created um, by the propellants has to be contained. And that generates a lot of uh, kinetic force and it also creates a lot of uh, thermal energy. And all of this structure must be protected or else you're going to have uh, failures. You're going to have failures in your rockets. Um, so if we move right along here. So when we actually start talking about like the engine purpose constraints, right? Like we're actually talking about what the engine is designed for and pretty much how it's supposed to integrate into the vehicle. Um, so... You have different things that you have to keep in, to, keep in mind when you're cho choosing your cooling technique, um, such as, as I mentioned, um, if you have only one rocket, then that's going to make life a little easier for certain things like, a, uh, like radiative cooling versus a cluster of rocket engine nozzles, right? If you actually use a cluster, now all that heat is being dissipated very, very, in a very, very close environment to other rocket engines that are also radiating heat. So something, you know, certain like radiative heating techniques are not going to be able to be used, right? So that's going to actually limit you in what you can actually use as your cooling technique. Um, other cooling techniques uh, are overall, the cooling techniques that we will be talking about today will cover the following. Regenerative cooling, radiative cooling, ablative, film and transpiration cooling. They're pretty much, they're pretty similar. They're almost the exact same thing. You have heat sink uh, technologies for cooling, um, dump cooling, and then of course you can have cooling techniques that use a combination of everything. So a typical combination of cooling techniques is using regenerative cooling around like your thrust chamber or your uh, combustion chamber, and then using transpiration or film cooling um, for the rest of your rocket, uh, your rocket engine. So the first thing that we want to come into and actually talk about here is your propellant choice, right? Because that actually limits you on a lot of your cooling techniques that you can actually employ. Um, so the different classes of propellants are earth storable hypergalls, right? So that's where any propellant that comes into contact with another propellant, they spontaneously combust, right? That's a hypergolic fuel. So you have um, something like hydrazine and nitrous oxide, right? When those two things come into, or nitrous tetroxide nitrous tetroxide. Um, so you have something like hydrazine and nitrous tetroxide that come together. Those are hypergolic, meaning that as soon as they touch, 
they explode. They, they combust instantly. Um, so you have Earth Storable Hyper Galls. Um, you also have your cryogenic, uh, cryogenic propellant um, with hydrogen as your fuel. That can actually be really, really good for regenerative cooling, um, as we've seen in real-world applications such as the RS-25, the Space Shuttle main engine, that use regenerative cooling with the hydrogen going through the engine. Um, and then you also have what's known as space storable propellants. Now, space, torbal, space storable propellants are um, usually cryogenic fuels, right, um, that can s remain in their liquid form in space. Um, so that is methalox, right, methane, um, or liquid methane is a space is considered a space stor storable propellant. Um, just because in the space environment, it requires very little to try, to try and keep it cold enough to, uh, to actually remain a liquid, right? We can actually run it through... Uh, heat exchangers to make sure it stays cold and then the vacuum of space and everything can generally keep it pretty cold. Um, and so basically this uh, will actually change your engine's operational constraints because each, di each different type of fuel burns with a different flame temperature and each ty uh, type of fuel has different uh, thermal capacities about actually how much heat they can retain within themselves, right? So that's going to limit you in like your regenerative cooling um, cases. Um, so basically, your propellant choice can really decide whether or not regenerative and film and transpiration cooling is viable, right? Because if they don't have very good uh, thermal conductivity and whatnot, that's going to make for a pretty poor regenerative cooling, uh, coolant. rather. Um, then you also have what's known as pulsing requirements, right? This is when a rocket engine is meant to be used on and off. So you can kind of think of it like a, uh, um, an RCS thruster, right, for just pulsing. Um, it's meant for rapid restarts. Um, tip, even rocket engines can be used for rapid restart capabilities. Um, so s something like pulsing, right, rapid on and off cycling, that can really limit you on what you can use as your recooling technique because regenerative cooling, right, requires a, a jacket to be filled up with coolant. And if you turn this on and off, you can actually get a lot of losses uh, due to waste propellant. Uh, same with film cooling and transpiration cooling. You have this, if you're, trying, if you're turning your rocket engine on and off, um, well, all of that coolant inside your rocket engine nozzle can uh, boil off and cause issues there. Um, so kind of definitely kind of limits you on the type of cooling that you can actually use for your rocket engine. So for pulse requirements, um, the applicable techniques are used most often are radiative, heat sink, and ablative cooling techniques, um, just because those are least susceptible to all of the, uh, you know, propellant losses and overall performance losses um, from other cooling. Um, then we also have prolonged burn times is another thing that you have to keep in mind on whether or not you're going to actually be using um, regenerative cooling or an ablative cooling system um, because this will imply a higher propellant to dry mass ratio, right? If we're having longer burn times, we're going to be carrying more fuel in comparison to something that only has to burn for a few seconds or even a minute. Um, so typically when you're talking about long burn times, this will increase your temperature requirements, right? Because now things are going to be burning for a lot longer, so your material um, or your thrust chamber will actually now inquire more heat, heat load. Um, so somewhere around there where, you know, you have higher heat tolerances that must be acquired by your coolant, that's going to, you're going to need to keep that in mind when you're actually talking about which, cool, uh, which cooling technique to use. Um, now, also for prolonged burn times, performance is also a really, really high um, parameter that you want to keep in mind. It's a really important parameter, right? Because if you're talking about um, burning for a really long time, you actually want your overall performance of your rocket engine to be, you know, at optimal performance. So you don't want to actually have any, like, propellant waste, so maybe something like film cooling isn't necessarily right for this application. Um, so that's what we're talking about when we talk about prolonged burn time requirements, that your rocket engine is going to be burning for a lot longer, your overall losses in your cooling technique are going to become, you know, exponentially larger and more important. Um, and then also, of course, you know, with longer burn times, you're going to increase your heat load on your engine. Um, so for this, uh, if you actually kind of talk about this restraint, the applicable techniques in this situation are regenerative, radiative, ablative, and then what's also known as open cycle regenerative cooling or dump cooling. Um, now, uh, ablative cooling can be used in this situation, but you also have to remember that if you're talking about prolonged burn times with increased heat loads, that ablative material now needs to be thicker. Um, and that, you know, the weight of your engine with the increase in the thickness of your ablative material increases with the burn time raised to the one half. Um, so it's not, you know, a direct proportional 
um, relationship, but you still have to worry about that. If you're talking about having a 10 minute burn time, well, that's going to increase your, your engine mass by a lot because that ablated material now has to be that much thicker. So um, our last, I guess, constraint that you have to worry about um, when you're actually choosing your overall cooling technique is throttling capabilities, right? Um, so what you see in a picture there is actually the um, Lunar Module Ascent engine. Uh, so that is actually the engine, or Descent engine, excuse me. So that is actually the schematic of the engine that was used on the LEM of the Apollo missions um, to actually descend down to the lunar surface. Um, so with throttling capabilities, right, you, you want your engine to be able to uh, have a wide range of throttle from like 100% down to maybe even as low as 5% or even lower within a percentage. Um, so when you have that, in terms of cooling, right, you're, you're limited in your regenerative cooling properties because your regenerative cooling really can't be limited so far because now you have to worry about your uh, mass flow rate of your propellant, right? If you're using regenerative cooling um, and you're not, and you're throttling down to such a low, um, a, a low throttle setting, now you're not getting enough propellant through your rocket engine cooling chambers to actually keep, you know, um, keep it cold. So you're kind of limited in the amount of regenerative cooling you can use depending on what the throttle actually is. Um, so overall, the applicable techniques to use in this situation are radiative cooling, that's used a lot. Um, ablative cooling, that is also used a lot on low throttle capable engines. So going back to other, you know, applicable cooling techniques are your regenerative cooling, but you have to remember that you're limited. Um, dump cooling is also another criteria you can use, but then you're going to incur losses because now you're dumping coolant overboard without combusting it, so you're, you're now acquiring performance losses. Heat sinks can also be used, but they're more time dependent, right? Because if you have long burn times, there's only so much heat that you can radiate off of a heat sink, and that also goes with radiative cooling. Um, you can also use film cooling and transpiration um, cooling as well, but again, you're going to acquire ISP and performance losses due to now you're just having fuel thrown overboard technically um, without actually expending it and combusting it to acquire all of this performance.